Well, let's see. He's slammed China. He's criticized Japan. He's insulted the Europeans. He's relentlessly hammered the Mexicans. He's also opened the door to more nuclear weapons around the globe. And he's a critic of free trade. Not exactly the type of diplomacy you're looking for in a commander in chief if you're a foreign leader. Now, the current commander is in Vietnam as we speak. He will meet with leaders of the world's largest countries this Thursday. And President Obama is already bracing for some of the questions and concerns about candidate Trump. For more on that, we're very pleased to be joined by Michael Wilhanla, a senior fellow in foreign policy from the Brookings Institution. Michael, good to talk to you as always. Nice to be with you. Thanks for having me. You know, I think it's fair to say that one of the things foreign leaders look to when they look at the United States is stability. Um, and you got to go back a long ways to think about a candidate, let alone a potential president, who would bring more instability, not just to a region, but theoretically the world. It's got to have these leaders on edge. Yeah, I think that's definitely right. And of course, one more thing that reinforces the point is they know how surprised we Americans have been by the rise of Trump. So I've been in conferences in, let's say, uh, East Asia in the last few months, towards the end of 2015, when all of the Americans confidently predicted that pretty soon Trump would fade and someone more traditional and more serious uh, would rise within the Republican Party to become the nominee. And obviously we were all wrong. And so when Americans who are known and trusted in these kinds of places are individually unable to predict what their country is up to, then that just amplifies the unpredictability of the candidate himself. And so uh, I think you're completely right. You know, when foreign leaders hear the phrase America first, um, we've talked and seen isolationism before, but you get the sense from some of them that that's a pretty way of saying extortion if they get military protection. Um, is there fear from some that if there is a President Trump, he's going to say, listen, in effect, I want a better trade deal if you want to continue to have me to be a presence in the region. We've seen uh, some of his language regarding Asia and other spaces in the world. Well, you're right. But first of all, let me start with the America First comment. Mr. Trump would benefit greatly if we actually debate the wisdom of that particular slogan or that particular priority, because any president needs to prioritize his or her own country. And so for President Trump to say America first in and of itself is not particularly threatening. And in fact, it would be uh, noteworthy only if the other side of the debate, the Democrat in the United States, were to challenge him over such a phrase, implying that he or she, in this case Mrs. Clinton, cared more about the well-being of other countries than about her own country. And that's, of course, not true. So uh, America first is almost an axiomatic priority for any U.S. president. The problem is with the specific policies that then follow from that worldview. And to your point, to the extent that Trump would actually break off alliances with long-standing security partners if they didn't meet some arbitrary uh, ceiling, let's say, or arbitrary floor on defense spending, that's where uh, the threatening ideas start to be uh, worrisome, or where he says it would be fine if other countries developed their nuclear weapons, or where he says he says he wants to have huge tariffs um, on either other countries or U.S. companies that might move their factories abroad, or, of course, where he wants to build giant walls, either physical walls on the Mexican border or virtual walls with the Muslim world. So these are the specific policies that are really bothersome, not so much the America First slogan. You know, you talked about nuclear proliferation. I, I got to imagine, in Japan, they're looking around saying, oh, wait a minute, what's he saying? Hey, you want to do it? Just get a nuke and protect yourself. Talk about what that would mean and why that's not necessarily in America's best interest, that everybody just go ahead and get their own nukes here and, um, and we'll let the other people fill the void of really the lone superpower in the world that we've assumed for a long time now. Yeah, great question. Let me give two specific examples without wrapping myself in big lofty notions like the norm against nuclear proliferation. I want to be very targeted on this point. One is to say 
It's, it's uh, potentially problematic if Japan and Korea get a nuclear weapon. It's really dangerous if Taiwan starts to move down that path. And if Trump is going to pull off the American security commitments from East Asia, Taiwan is the place where you would expect them to have some serious incentives to get the bomb. Because, of course, China claims Taiwan and has not accepted the notion that Taiwan can be indefinitely separate from China the way it is today. And so if Taiwan felt there was no more potential American military help in the event of a crisis with mainland China, Taiwan might have a great incentive to develop the bomb. But that's exactly what China has said could be the trigger to war, either a Taiwanese declaration of independence or a Taiwanese pursuit of a nuclear weapon. So that's the dynamic in East Asia that I worry about even more than Japan or Korea, both of them responsible, established countries getting the bomb. Taiwan is also technologically sophisticated and responsible, but it's not an independent country. It's not recognized as separate by China. And if it were to pursue a nuclear weapon, that could lead to war very easily. And finally, Michael, I assume the same thing goes when it comes to treaties. Trump basically said NATO is just a, you know, a jumbled an acronym and who cares. But if there's no NATO with a strong U.S. that's got a presence, kind of what we saw with Ukraine, for example, with Russia, you're almost asking people to fill vacuums there, aren't you? Yeah, and it's even worse than that, I think, in this case, because let's say we did start to suggest a weakening commitment to NATO or Trump launched some year-long policy review about whether we should eliminate NATO or pull back our commitment to our NATO allies. And during that year of American indecision and rethinking of the alliance, Russia decides to challenge Estonia or Latvia, one of the newest NATO member states that used to be part of the Soviet Union. What are we going to do? Are we really going to fight for it? But can we really wash our hands of the problem? You know, even if we were willing to be cynical and let our future allies have to fend for themselves. And by the way, the Baltic states are doing pretty well at pulling along their fair share of the common uh, burden sharing uh, responsibility. So it would have some moral problems as well, I think. Always a little bit more complicated than just the sound bite. Michael, as always, I appreciate a few. Thank you. Thank you very much. And coming up next, is three a crowd or is it exactly what the American people want? Why this could be the year of a third party candidate, why that idea actually could have a chance.